Yes. All right, uh, welcome back, everyone. It is my uh, pleasure and also my honor to do introduce to you today's uh, keynote lecture with Lydia Alcock from Hunter College, CUNY, City University of New York, who is currently also a uh, visiting scholar. The big rival, the, the <laughs> University of Amsterdam. <laughs> Not really, 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 really. Anyway, so uh, at the UFA, uh, it's named the Spinoza uh, Chair, and she'll be here for about uh, a couple of months, basically. Uh, she has written extensively on numerous issues such as feminist epistemology, social epistemology, philosophy of race, decolonial theory, and also various issues in continental philosophy, and maybe particularly the figure and philosophy of Michel Foucault. Um, she is known for numerous books, three of which I would like to mention here, and I'm going to read them just to make sure I don't make a mistake in the title or the date. So it's Visible Identities, Race, Gender and the Cell, that was 2006, The Future of Whiteness, 2015, and then Rape and Resistance in 2018. And she's also published her work in more public venues, such as the New York Times and uh, the Guardian. So today, today, today she's going to speak on communicating across epistemological systems. She just told me that uh, she's giving numerous talks during these few months, but this one she has written specifically for us for today. So that is wonderful. <laughs> I'm proud of that. Um, so after that, uh, we'll get a reply by Yaron Harambal, who's right here, also from the UVA, at least as things stand now. So he used to be with the Catholic University of Louvain, and then this university, the Free University, and now with the UVA, where he is an assistant professor in the sociology department. And he's known particularly for his work in conspiracy theorizing or conspiracy theory belief or various uh, terms here in the semantic realm. And uh, one book I would like to mention in particular, and let me get the full title right, is Contemporary Conspiracy Culture of Truth and Knowledge in an Era of Epistemic Instability. That was 2020, I believe, with Routledge. Right, that's correct. Right, so that is a fantastic book, rather theoretical also. Here is also a slightly more practical, um, it's like twin version of it. Um, that is called The Truth is Out There, which contains, is it in Dutch actually, contrary to what the title might suggest. And that contains a wonderful series of interviews with diverse people, all of whom to some extent embrace conspiracy theories. So um, let me warmly recommend to you both books. So that's the plan for now. And uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I, I want to uh, thank uh, Nora for the for the introduction um, because you got my brain going with this topic and it is related to a book project that I have on decolonial epistemology. Um, I'm cannibalizing a little bit of that for this talk, but uh, it's been very interesting and I've really enjoyed the papers today and I look forward to tomorrow and I want to apologize also to um, uh, it's called, it's Jaron, isn't that your first name? For Americans, it often is. Okay, sorry. So that's just by now. Okay. Um, yeah, that's clever. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's the way. If he just got the paper this week, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he hasn't had, you know, sufficient time, but um, I'm just really interested to see what he thinks. So, um, what I wanted to do is to um, uh, begin with a concept that I'm getting from Brianna Toole in a recent paper on the epistemological obstacles involved in addressing white supremacy. And what Toole does is she, um, she talks about this concept of epistemological system that I want to bring in. Um, the name of her essay is What Lies Beneath the Epistemic Roots of White Supremacy. And she draws from work by Christy Dodson and also from Peter Realton to develop this concept of epistemological system. And part of it is, you know, the, the idea of trying to bring in our, our usual concept of the social system, right? What is a social system? The way we talk about it is that it is a system to organize political and material practices with an eye toward repetition, so with an eye toward conservation. Um, and social systems help us move beyond individual intent, even the aggregate of individual intent, 
um, to see choice structures that reproduce existing power relations, right? That's what social systems do. Um, so I think she's bringing, she's uh, bringing in Christy Dotson's concept of the epistemological system to sort of animate some similar concepts and ideas for us. And the idea is that an epistemological system um, rank and exclude certain types of knowers, right? And identify and distribute epistemic resources such as credibility in a way that maintains and facilitates social hierarchies. So Dotson says, epistemological systems include operative, instituted social imaginaries, habits of cognition, attitudes toward knowers, and or any relevant sensibilities that encourage or hinder the production of knowledge. Um, so as Tool says, these systems shape not just what we know, but what we are in a position to know, right? What we are capable of knowing. So the you know the 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 infamous example we we all use today is the need for video cameras to get larger non-black publics to recognize the reality of police violence. Police murderous violence was not new to black and brown communities in the United States uh, in 2012. It was known about for a very long time. And video cameras, of course, aren't perfect. I mean, because people can look at videos and still see them with instituted social imaginaries and not see what is actually happening. But the fact that it took video cameras to really create a sizable improvement in the transmission of knowledge between groups is an obvious case for what is going on, right? What are the epistemological systems that are sometimes group related, some aspects of them may be partly group related, that block the transmission of knowledge. And that's what Tool is, is wanting to talk about. But she also brings in this interesting work by Peter Railton, who's more of a political philosopher. He's a Marxist, by the way. Is this Mark? Yeah. Is, okay. I thought it was, but Nora and I were trying to get that serious look, like he was interrogating um, what I'm saying here. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Peter Railton uses the concept of epistemic frames that orient our expectations and our attention just as a camera frame might orient our visual field, he says. So, so what this does is, is it affects our interpretation of new encounters and new experiences, which can be overdetermined by these frames. So <clears throat> using this, I want to raise the question of how do we communicate across epistemological firm, epistemological systems for um, epistemic frames. And um, I want to suggest that um, we use the, the, we also need to use the, the concept of the epistemological system in a normatively neutral way. So tool, neither tool nor Dotson or Railton is saying that epistemological systems are always nefarious. Tool takes a, this um, position, she says, these systems are useful, indeed necessary. The problem lies in the, the resiliency of faulty or maladaptive epistemological systems. So, so they don't take the concept of an, of an epistemological system as necessarily nefarious. And in fact, Tool thinks that they're necessary in this time period um, that helps us deal with the glut of information that we're all taking in. It helps us to sort of organize and categorize it. But um, she's concerned about the resilience of maladaptive or faulty epistemological systems. And she says that resilience is maximized 
by a system's disguise or invisibility. And this is a point I'm going to come back to at the end. So, um, I just said this. So this is the question, how do we communicate across epistemological systems? One of the things that epistemological systems can do is sustain credibility and justice. And I like the term credibility and justice, which is a broader term than Fricker's term of testimonial injustice, because I think it gets at a broader uh, range of kinds of, of uh, discursive interactions. So um, credibility and justice targets group social identities. And group social identities, as has already been talked about today, vary, right? So everybody in the group doesn't think in the same way or operate in the same way. And you need an intersectional analysis. But one of the things that vary less within groups is um, within marginalized and oppressed groups is the experience of negative characterizations of the group, right? So we might say, um, uh, to use a contentious example, all Jews experience at some point negative characterizations, but there is so much disagreement within the Jewish community over how to deal with that, over Israel, over Zionism, right? There's no agreement within the group. But what is shared is having to deal with it, right? What is shared is experiencing it. What is shared is not being able to as easily ignore it as maybe other people can. So those experiences of negative characterization can provide a powerful source of connection among those targeted, despite the fact that they may have very different political interpretations of it. And so Tommy Shelby has argued in his first book, We Who Are Dark, that the negative experience of anti-Black racism is the basis of Black solidarity. He makes that the only basis of Black solidarity. And a lot of people think that's a little too thin. But, he, but his argument is right, that that is a shared element and it does motivate um, uh, various kinds of activities of interpretation and activism in the community. So credibility and justice then can be defined as social patterns that undervalue cognitive competence based on group identity. And the second thing I want to argue is that this problem of sustained credibility and justice is not solved by traditional conceptions of objectivity. In fact, it is exacerbated by traditional conceptions of objectivity. So why is that? Well, credibility and justice is defined, um, we might argue that it includes the undervaluing of judgment, of memory, of perception, of trustworthiness, and of specific expertise, right? So it involves a range of epistemic activities. And the idea of, of traditional objectivity is that um, you're, you're able to put your experience or your memory or your uh, background behind you, right? And not have it animate or inform or help you interpret new experiences. So you are dispassionate. You are, um, you can rise above, right? You can be neutral. And the idea that you can do this blocks our capacity or blocks our motivation to be reflective. So um, some individuals can try to achieve credibility justice or credibility uh, and by assimilating to the, nor the dominant norms of practice and dissociating from their group identity. And there's a lot of great sociological work on this. How women scientists dress like male scientists. <laughs> and uh, you, know, you, can, you do it with dress, you do it with the way we speak, with the kinds of things that we choose to talk about 
in um, a mixed company and with the kinds of work that we do, right? We assimilate and that's how we heightened our level of credibility. But this of course doesn't do anything for credibility and justice because it doesn't um, disrupt the arguments, the reasons, the assumptions that are made in determining credibility and justice for groups. So um, the point is that it's not that the epistemic norms of credibility are just and just need to be universally applied to all. Rather, we need to be open to the possibility that the accepted universal norms of credibility might need some reflective work and some critique. One of the examples that um, I got from Lorraine Code is that there was a, a case of a public inquiry of, into infant death from cardiac arrest in Canada. She's a Canadian philosopher. And in this um, public inquiry, doctors were asked to come and testify before the committee and they were asked by the government members what they knew. And nurses were also asked to come and testify before the committee and they were asked about their experience. So you had these different terms, knowledge, um, asked of the doctors and experience asked of the nurses. And this is an interesting binary because um, there is an acknowledgement that experience is necessary for knowledge, right? There's a, there's a recognition that, that experience is necessary. That's basic empiricism. But experience isn't sufficient. Experience has to be assessed, interpreted, analyzed in order to you know, rise to the level of knowledge. Um, it has to be processed. So what you can have is um, an actual formulation. Let me see if I have this on here. With this uh, reverse empiricism in which um, those with the most experience are given the least credibility. And many of us who've taught in um, majority classrooms, dominant group classrooms experience this, right? I have enormous credibility when I, when I teach epistemology to my philosophy students. But when I started one time to talk about the United States invasion of Panama, my home country, students like began to look down and I, I sensed, you know, that my credibility was lacking because I was seen as speaking from my experience. I was, I was seen as probably angry as I was, although I was trying to like be very, you know, sort of cool in the classroom. But if you have too much experience, personal experience, direct experience, that counts against you. And I, and I don't know if this applies to everybody, but it applies certainly to those of us who are, who are from non-dominant groups. So I call this a form of reverse empiricism. Those with the most experience are the least reliable. We're not gonna ask a person of color, did you think that that racist, did you think that that comment was racist? I mean, we, you know, some of us in this room, we will ask, <laughs> right? People will think that, many times people will think that a person of color <laughs> will jump to conclusions about whether a comment is racist and will put their thumb on the scale in a sense, right? To determine whether a comment is in fact racist. So it's that kind of phenomena that um, I think is, is what code is concerned about with the, the, uh, the validation of nurses having experience, but not knowledge. So the, the, the issue of objectivity, you know, has been debated quite a lot and, philosophy of science and in social epistemology. And the point that Sandra Harding makes, I think is, is very useful. She says that um, traditional objectivity um, uh, thwarts our self-reflection, but she thinks that we need to hold on to the conception of objectivity because objectivity involves more than who actively participates in making scientific decisions. It also involves the question of whose agendas science does and should pursue. 
whose hypotheses, whose concepts, whose preferred research designs, whose preferred understandings of nature, of social relations and inquiry should be supported in multicultural democracy. So we need to think about objectivity, not just in the sense of assessing outcomes or conclusions, but also formulating inquiry. And so she argues that a more robust understanding of objectivity could enhance the critical investigation into shared group assumptions by not, not by simply having more diverse research teams, and that's all we need to do, but rather by starting research from below. And what she means by that is starting research designs, starting research topics, formulating agendas, right? Um, concept hypotheses from below. Um, and this is a process that she says does not imply absolute deference. So it's not about providing a kind of absolute epistemic status to those who come from below, but of, of generating um, projects and questions from below. Okay, so um, what I wanna do um, in the second half of this is to talk about some case studies. Um, and uh, I'm going to start with the current intense debate over museum collections. I'm going to go to the Colonial Museum on Sunday. I'm very interested <laughs> to, to see how it's been changed, what extent it's been changed. Um, but what I've been doing research on for the last few years is particular controversy in the United States over the display of human remains of indigenous peoples in, in North America. The display of human remains is pretty um, familiar to us in the British Museum. You go into the mummies, but the mummies are like 2,500 years old. These are human remains of 100 years ago, sometimes less, um, of indigenous peoples who were victims of colonial genocide and who are put on display. And sometimes, <clears throat> in some cases, the body is put on display. In some cases, the bodies are kept back in storerooms for the purview of, of uh, recognized experts to assess. Um, <clears throat> currently, there are um, wait till I get to that. There are over 1,500 museums that house several million such artifacts. And of course, most of these artifacts came into museum hands in fishy ways. They were stolen or they were taken or they were purchased from people who were desperate for money. There was also outright theft, looting, and the plundering of graves. Philip Deloria, who is, by the way, the grandson of the famous Vine Deloria, um, <clears throat> indigenous theorist, explains the epistemological outcomes of such extractions as follows. He says, a collection created a vast web of possibilities for recontextualization, for moving objects out of one location and into another. The most important recontextualization may have centered on the authority of the collectors themselves, for the objects constituted them as unique figures of authority, of epistemic authority, right? So the museum collectors and the museum curators. So the, the, um, there has been a, a movement for several decades now in the United States to demand the return of human remains. Um, for, and it's, been fought out in the courts and it's been fought out in, in social movements politically. Um, Gail Guthrie Valascakis argues that along with land and treaty rights, native people are laying claim to Indian objects and images, to museums and to history. Across yeah. Indian country, this move to transform the present, I wanna focus on that phrase she uses, to transform the present and negotiate the future by recovering the past has contributed to new debates, 
reclaiming memory, experience, and imagination. So, that. so um, uh, what kind of knowledge museums can impart is uh, subject to debate here, and how the knowledge is that they house impact the relations involved in ongoing knowledge projects that are necessary for building new futures and improving group relations is um, under discussion here. So that's my interest. I think there's a widespread, you can get a widespread public support for understanding that displaying human remains, especially the victims of genocidal colonial violence is immoral. But there's a but the larger issue or the more deeper issue is the epistemic one because the museum curators who defend this this practice make arguments on epistemic grounds right they say we are protecting universal knowledge for the world culture right so we have universal aims epistemic aims. And uh, we, we have the technical expertise solely to provide that. So there's an epistemic piece of it. That that's what I'm focused on. So it turns out that there was this um, crusader, this Italian guy, Siriaco de Pizzicola. And so much stuff started with the Crusades. He um, came back from the Crusades. He brought a whole bunch of stuff back. And he is the one who is credited was arguing that material objects are more epistemically reliable than mere textual descriptions or oral histories, right? So the idea is you can get an oral history of something, but you need material evidence to document or to back up the claim that's in the oral history. The oral history in and of itself isn't going to be epistemically reliable unless you have some object. So, um, he is sometimes credited as being the founder of archaeology. He was an Italian merchant from the 14th century who fought in the Crusades against the Turks. And he argued that ancient things were more faithful sources of knowledge about classical antiquity than mere textual reports, even those written at the time um, of, the, of the, uh, the period of time that's being studied. So it's the epistemic importance of material objects that I'm interested in. I mean, obviously, I would support the removal of human remains for the moral reasons alone. But it's the epistemic arguments that, that I think have to be addressed and are a bit more complicated. Um, so the argument is that if museums were forced to return all of these remains, significant sources of knowledge could be lost or compromised. By contrast, the advocates of repatriation often made claims about the moral duty to respect those human beings whose homes were being bartered, monetized, and displayed. Some groups also made claims about the powers of the dead over the living, and they argued that the human remains could enact vengeance on those who mistreated them. So you had a variety of kinds of claims made for repatriation, requiring a choice about what kinds of reasons would be given priority or what kinds of reasons would even be acknowledged as valid. So in 1990, under increasing pressure from social movements of native activists, the United States government passed the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act, which is really significant, NAGPRA. You don't have anything like it quite in Europe yet, although there's beginning to be a little trickle of returns of things. But um, this law mandated that Native groups had the right to claim the remains of their tribal members. Um, and it had a major impact. It led to the return of tens of thousands of human remains. However, as of today, more than 100,000 continue to be housed in museums. And what the struggle going on today is to um, expand NAGPRA because the way the law was written was that only human remains that could be identified as a member of a particular tribe 
would be returned to that tribe, but there's a lot of human remains that they couldn't identify as belonging to a particular tribe. But that wasn't even the worst part of it. The worst part of it was who was going to adjudicate whether or not there was sufficient evidence to determine whether a particular body belonged to a particular tribe, the museum curators. So it wasn't a dialogic um, engagement with uh, tribal peoples. The, the other issue that's, that's quite interesting to me is that um, what was going to be done with the human remains? And here I wanna, I wanna give an example um, of some miscommunication that will maybe spark our conversation. So some groups argued that there are artisanal objects created by human beings such as that are produced objects. Um, one example of these is called the Ahayuda, which are wooden objects, and they're taken to be war gods or keepers of the sky. And they've long been traded as commodities among non-native peoples. But native peoples argue that the Ahayuda have spiritual elements and deserve to be included in the re repatriation laws, despite the fact that tribal practices will then place these objects outside and allow them to deteriorate over time. There's two interesting issues here for me. One is that, that they say the Ahayuda are living beings, not in our artisanal objects. They're living beings, they have spirit. And the second is that what they intend to do with them, and this also is something that is done with some human remains by some groups, is put them outside, and where they originally were, and they will eventually be destroyed naturally by the element. So the, the struggle is over ontological assumptions about how to conceptualize objects, as well as how to prioritize diverse conceptions of value. So these debates continue to be represented as a conflict between the forces of reason, science, and modernity on the one hand, and pre-modern myth, superstition, and religion on the other. So it's a stacked deck. And you, you, know, you get representations in like the New York Times or other newspapers about these debates. And it's, you know, it's really hard to get wide public support. So I wanna give an example of a miscommunication here that happened from, um, uh, based on uh, the work of Marisol de la Cadena, Earth Beings, from her book, Earth Beings, Ecology, the Practice Across Andean Worlds. Marisol de la Cadena is an anthropologist who is originally from Colombia, from South America. She learned Quechua and spent um, many, many years in a project she called co-laboring. Let me get this thing out of the way. You know, I have the skill set. Oh, well, it's it's just, I mean, there's just two names co laboring with uh, the two Quechua leaders, Mariano Turpo and Nazario Turpo. And she recounts, an and they were asked by the um, United States National Museum of the American Indian to be consultants for an exhibition that was planned for 2015, in which um, there would be uh, a return of some human remains in a, in a kind of a public event. The work of translation in this collaboration was enormous, as she shows, and it failed. But it failed in a way that the museum officials, at least at the time, did not understand. Translation work across wide cultural diver divergences can yield some partial communication. This is where I'm going to end up um, arguing. But it cannot avoid some misrepresentation. For example, I referred to, or I, I refer in the paper to Nazario Turpo as a leader of his group of the Quechua, but this is a mistranslation 
his community's understanding of what it means to be in ILU, which is their word for representation, is not our understanding of representational, it's relational, right? So to be in ILU requires a significant unpacking and dialogue for outsiders to grasp. It's something like the obediential power that Enrique Dussel talks about from, from the Zapatistas. So the National Museum of the American Indian pursued Turpro's help in a project of repatriation of human remains. But as with the case of the Ahayuda, there were challenges to the translation of concepts. Human remains are divided by the Quechua into two different sorts, depending on the era in which they lived. Those that lived in a different era are referred to as sukakuna, and their contact with living beings today is considered potentially dangerous. Turpo believed the remains in question that the National Museum of American Indian wanted to um, return may have lost their power or been tamed in the intervening period by changes in material conditions or by the blessings of priests. Just to be safe, however, when the remains were returned, Turpo and his family organized several events to reduce the likelihood of negative effects. The National Museum of the American Indian officials, however, as De La Cadena recounts, were thrilled to witness the ceremonies, which they saw as a celebration of the repatriation of ancestors' remains. The Sukakuna, as potentially dangerous entities, were lost in the translation of this event. So she, she describes this incident as one in a long series of mistranslations or following Eduardo Vivieres de Castro concept of um, equivocations. Oh, I can't get it to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> something I did, something that happened before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. This this concept of equivocation. Um, I want to bring in here. Um, equivocations are neither errors nor failures, De Castro says, but communicative disjunctures in which interlocutors are not talking about the same thing. Communicative disjunctures, he calls them. So equivocations are constitutive features of cultural translation. They are unavoidable, but this also means that they are incorrectly understood as failures. So attempting to overcome them is the wrong goal, he argues. Colonial ventures used force, of course, to try to destroy languages, in a vain attempt to produce singular univocal meaning. Epistemic collaborations are hobbled by such methods, not enhanced. So a dialogic collaboration across cultures, the Castro and De La Cadena argue, cannot be effective if it seeks to purge all differences in the pursuit of complete univocality. Instead, there needs to be a steady awareness of divergences within communicative practices. Productive and positive relations between speakers do not require perfect translatability. And in fact, the attempt to bridge differences is going to diminish relations, erode trust, and actually eclipse the quality of understanding that's genu genuinely possible. If either party were to cease communication when equivocations occur, this could only be, be because commonality and similarity are assumed necessary for communication. So that's what we have to give up. It's the assumption that the commonality and similarity are necessary features for communication. Because this downplays, uh, or this, uh, this motivates the kind of silencing and then downplaying of divergences. So let me figure out how to uh, draw some conclusions from this. But as, you can, as you'll see, I haven't, figured out all the conclusions. So maybe you can help me with this part of it. I think the problem with museums that house human remains cannot be simply represented as a moral and political problem without epistemic implication. Material objects of all sorts are sources of knowledge, 
and yet their interpretation requires contextualization and collaboration with cultural insiders, right? This, the material object itself doesn't have its, doesn't write its meaning on it. You need the, the like with the example of the National Museum of, of uh, um, uh, American Indians not understanding what the material object of the human remain, how, how it was actually understood by the Quechua. So everything in collaboration is a positive practice that needs to be encouraged. And the conditions necessary for it to proceed should be protected, even while the inevitability of equivocation is accepted. So if the focus turns to developing robust relations over time, rather than securing particular outcomes that can be monetized, certainly, epistemic possibilities for advancing greater understanding will be enhanced. So Marisol de la Cadena describes her work with her Quechua partners, Mariano and Nazario Turco, as a work of co-laboring. So this is not about an exchange, but about a joint project. What was the project of the Turcos and, and working with her? What they said their project was, was to preserve the old ways. And this was also her project. So to co-labor with them, De La Cadena had to shift her methodological practices since the training she had received about discerning truths of history did not work in this setting. She could not question and investigate their claims, for example. She was able to consult their archives of documents of meetings and events from decades past, but some of the events that the Turpos narrated for her had no associated documents. So she came to see that the historical ontology of modern knowledge both enables its own questions, answers, and understanding, and disables as unnecessary or unreal the questions, answers, and understandings that fall outside of it, outside of its purview or are excessive of it. She realized that her, that her initial formulation of her project was within these bounds, positioning Mariano as a source, right? An outside source to confirm or document um, her own uh, project. Uh, one of the differences is that the mountain range in their region, which they name Asangate, is an earth being. That's the title of her book. So it's an earth being. And they see Asangate as an influential player in the history of their community and its agrarian practices. So again, to, to try to move to conclusion here, there are many um, challenges to translation, to communication across epistemological systems, across languages. Walter Benjamin noted that words are embedded in ways that enliven connotations differently. In some cases, there are no comparable words. Apparently, there is no word for magic in Quechua. And perhaps the strongest challenge is that words are not always taken to be symbols for other groups, right? So in many languages, to say the word, it's like saying I marry, right? In Austin sense, to say the word is to um, bring into existence something. Um, so another meaning will be enlivened. So Nazario Turco concluded from all of this that when Marisol spoke a word or phrase in Quechua, he said something else it was going to say. In other words, he thought another meaning would be enlivened when she said it. Um, and he didn't see this necessarily as a problem. And he was interested to see what that something else that it would say would, would be. The challenges to translation are central to this. The attempt to translate perfectly by creating equivalencies has the effect of erasing difference. So the task must be to communicate um, in a way that achieves some success without erasing difference. And when this is done over a long period of co-laboring as she practiced it, 
the result is not the acquisition of plural meanings set side by side, but new meanings that come into existence. Um, what we might draw from this, I think, is the need to downscale what might be expected of translation work. The, I think um, to return to the concept of epistemological system, the examples that I'm drawn for you show that obstacles to communication come in two broad forms. One is you have the disparity of concepts and language, but the second is the more important one, which is the erosion of relationships through colonialism and through extractivist projects. Knowledge that is extracted and disembedded from its contextual relationships is likely to limit communication so that a ceremony to protect the living is misunderstood as a ceremony to welcome the dead. Knowledge projects built on co-laboring with shared power will produce new knowledge rather than perfect translation. And finally, I just wanna make one last point here because I'm worried about the tendency when we use these kinds of examples um, to uh, lend support for certain kind of essentializing uh, of, of different groups. Um, and I think this is an obvious point, but it bears repeating. And this is that radical difference of the sort that we might see in these examples is not something that indigenous people have. This is what Vila Cadena says. It's a relational condition, right? So radical difference is something that's produced in the interaction between two parties or more parties, rather than something that's located in the indigenous other. It is constituted equally by both sides. And although there's a constant and ongoing denial of difference by elite authorities, and I can give you lots of examples of that, taking the form of dismissing Asangate's existence as a superstition rather than a distinct belief, that kind of problem is not going to be solved by recognition or inclusion at the behest of the state, since this will always come with restrictions. And I think this can happen in, in the academy, obviously, also. The clear benefit to us of radical difference is puzzlement, right? It causes us to question our basic ontological concepts. Um, you have this epistemic disconcertment, um, as De La Cadena calls it, or uncertainty that can spark us to think new thoughts and challenge our received views. But as the, the anthropologist Elizabeth Povinelli says, the instrumentalization of radical difference becomes the call to be other so that we do not ossify, but be in such a way that we are not undone, right? So there's limits that we're gonna put on how much we're going to let that radical difference or that um, challenging conceptualization, uh, in fact, challenge us. This can be the implicit goal of translation. So that's why I like the alternative concept that she gives us of co-laboring, which is an attempt to honor the process rather than its product and to create new relationships, not speaking across, but alongside and getting words to say something new. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alko, Linda, um, I really, like I got the text, so I feel privileged because uh, there's a lot of information and a lot of uh, new concepts to think with and through. And I think uh, if you look at my notes, uh, it shows very well how much it sparks all kinds of ideas and comments. And I really um, Thank you for the text and for the uh, arrangement of my ideas. Uh, thank you, uh, Naomi and Rick, for inviting me to comment on your text. Mm -hmm.
because I think it really deserves uh, uh, another layer of interpretation of thought, and I really recommend reading it um, because I also notice when you hear it, it can be a lot, um, and there's a lot lost in, in, in uh, the processing of information. Um, so I'm also very pleased to comment because um, feminist epistemologies uh, have been one of the major uh, breakthroughs in my own uh, uh, academic uh, career and my own thinking and that really uh, they opened my eyes to a lot of um, well ways of, of thinking about knowledge systems and how definitely they are uh, embedded in our relations in society and that is already uh, I think an important sort of uh, realization how not well it's a very Foucauldian uh, assumption, uh, of course, our knowledge systems are products of we're super immersed in power relations. So the first um, effort that I see in this um, chapter is very much this, this effort to step away from these universalist conceptions of truth and knowing, um, but making them uh, culturally situated. Um, and that also means sort of this is the starting point you uh, began your talk with of approaching these different cultural systems of or epistemic systems as you call them uh, Foucault would call them epistems or so I'm also curious about these different uh, concepts if they are the same and different um, but this idea of epistemological systems I'm a sociologist so for me that resonates a lot with uh, cultural worldviews uh, and systems of of understanding the belief systems more or less. Um, so I really enjoy this idea of also approaching these different belief systems in a neutral way, meaning um, parking the societal hierarchies that they have in everyday life, of course. Um, I'm also curious how you think of approaching these systems neutrally. <clears throat> Because what you show very well is how there are very much, uh, how there are hierarchies of knowing, how different belief systems have different societal statuses. So when we speak about epistemological systems and having different epistemological systems, um, credibility systems is then sort of the connection you make to these hierarchies. Um, and so for the whole concept of, of, of cultural worldviews as uh, central in how people interpret the world around them uh, is, I think, crucial here. And I think of the work of Mary Douglas, and as a, a great uh, anthropologist, but also in political science, you see uh, people like Dan Cahan and Jonathan Haidt, who very much emphasize the cultural uh, situatedness of belief systems. Um, but I want to go actually to these hierarchies, um, because I find that Fascinating, of course, as a sociologist, what kind of hierarchies of knowing do we uh, see? And uh, I think one of the most important hierarchy uh, that we see is, is the distinction between male and female ways of knowing. And I feel a bit awkward to speak about that, but that has been one of the eye openers again in my life um, in terms of when I learned really um, what feminism entails and what feminist epistemologists have been arguing for. And I don't want this to be a form of mansplaining. Uh, so <laughs> there's an uncomfort, a discomfort here for me at least. But I think I want to, as a sociologist, really uh, uh, give empirical examples of these great, uh, uh, more analytical um, uh, discussions you have touched upon today. Um, so these hierarchies of knowing, right? And you see them in everyday life everywhere. Um, uh, you talk about indigenous people and white superiority. Uh, the same counts for male superiority over female superiority. But I think also uh, if you look at class, as a sociologist, I'm also very much interested in class. And this comes in life, uh, yeah, this, come, this manifests itself in so many different ways. When I'm doing, for example, focus groups, uh, and talking to different people about a certain topic. You see so well how uh, higher classes are in, within, within five minutes dominating this room uh, with the way they talk, the concepts they use, the language they use, the, the ease and the authority they have in speaking. Uh, and, and, and I always have yeah, strong difficulties to 
get the people from lower classes that are not that confident in speaking uh, about complex topics or everyday life or what doesn't really matter. They feel intimidated by the language. So you see that here in, in, in class. Uh, you see it also in regional accents that you have perhaps. Well, in the US, you also do have them. I mean, people from the South are less, are seen as less intelligent, credible, uh, etc. but only by means of their accent. Uh, we have the same here in a tiny country that like it's like so many different accents designating where you're from, what your so social status is. <laughs> so when you see someone on television with a southern accent, also in Holland, uh, people don't take them seriously or much more difficult. Uh, so here you, you see how these uh, uh, cultural or these credibility systems, as you call them, um, yeah, uh, have so such strong societal resonance. So the hierarchies of knowing, and I think we all live, know how much we live in a world dominated by science and the scientific worldview. So the scientific way of knowing trumps it all. Uh, all kinds of other ways of knowing are less valuable. It's like what you said, our experience uh, counts less as objective scientific knowledge. Uh, even though the, those with experience should be able to say most of the, the things they are talking about. Um, so this specific, highly specific way of knowing, the scientific way of knowing, um, becomes also a very historically powerful one, right? So, uh, and that's, I think, one of the main points that you make, asking to abide to this allegedly neutral or objective way of knowing, is very much an exercise of power. It's of conforming to the uh, the powerful. Uh, so I think this is a very uh, important point that you make throughout your text about also the requirement of people to abide to one system of knowledge, even though that is allegedly a neutral one, uh, is an exercise of power. So I'm really here trying to uh, yeah interpret your your talk a bit more so that. It, comes across, hopefully, uh, even stronger uh, to the people. So then the question, of course, is how do we overcome these uh, epistemic or epistemological systems? How do we communicate across these? That's the, the, the topic of your talk. Um, especially if we cannot find a solution in one system that supposedly uh, is able to incorporate them all, right? So there's no pursuit of uni univocality, I should call it. There's no subsuming in one neutral system. Um, there's no translation also uh, possible, or there is translation possible, but that's not the goal to translate perfectly uh, because it's the junctures, the communicative junctures that you see as important. So keeping differences intact. Uh, and I think that is also a very beautiful uh, way of thinking about these differences and you end with the idea of co-laboring so not just translating but working together uh, in the pursuit of new meanings all right so i think that's sort of my interpretation of of, of your talk and then i have a number of uh, questions and i also am because I'm curious, right? This co-laboring sounds uh, wonderful and exciting, but it also sounds abstract to me, right? I'm looking for, like, how can we do it? Um, and I would like you to, I would like to invite you to think with me of a research project that I got funding for last year, which involves the, um, um, which involves citizen assemblies as a way to uh, deal with complex. Uh, societal issues and here it is about climate change about uh climate science actually um because normally these citizen assemblies are getting traction in europe so that's the idea of putting a random uh amount of people together like by lottery uh by tradition so uh as to have ordinary people communicate about complex issues uh from their own perspectives in a sort of power free um environment over a longer period of time so these are sort of the characteristics um, the idea is that through this exchange um, people get to know each other um, instead of debating they're deliberating 
they are discussing. They're trying to uh, put themselves in the positions of other people. Um, so there is opportunities for what you call co-laboring. And I think that that is a, a so uh, I, I would like you to sort of also later on and the rest of you to think with me if that is a viable or a, a, an example of how you see co-laboring come about. So you also speak of, um, um, where is it? Well, about, for example, science, the role of science, because these citizen assemblies are not to arrive at a political decision in my research project, but to arrive at a research agenda. It's about climate science. So scientists, climate scientists think they know what uh, knowledge we need. Um, and for good reasons, they are experts in their field, they have all kinds of uh, knowledge and expertise and understanding of what kind of knowledge is important, but they also are not um, connected to the lives of everyday people in our societies who may have different ideas or wishes or information interests. So this is the, the objective of these citizen assemblies, right? To have a more dialogical way of setting the science agenda, of starting anew, not only of translating science to different people so that they understand the severity of our climate uh, situation, but in, indeed turning the thing around and starting bottom up, um, making the science agenda together. Um, so that is a project. It's an experiment. Uh, it's also not happening yet. It will happen uh, this fall, but we're working with that. And I'm curious to see uh, how you uh, relate to sort of these efforts to bring different kinds of people with different cultural worldviews, with different epistemological systems together to work together on complex societal issues, if that would be a form of co-laboring that you see happening. Because it's a very different context that you speak about of indigenous cultures and, and, and white uh, uh, colonial into a more uh, well contemporary society where we have different cultural groups. Um, I think I will leave it with that because I'm also running late, but I had two questions. And that is, you speak about um, starting from below. So I was wondering, what do you do when from below is not the emancipatory um, potential or groups that you're talking about, but what if from below are the uh, angry, uh, violent, anti-democratic, misogynic um, people. Us. Could be, yeah. <laughs> that is one question I have. And then, well, and then, well, the other question, you also kept it as a question, but that's, I think, a very interesting one for all of us to think through. How do you adjust the date between these different systems? Uh, because our system, for example, uh, the adjudicate, yeah, if like, we think about law, Right, as a uh, and, the, and the judge, as the superior one to just adjudicate these different systems. Is that, uh, I think that would be the opposite of what you entail. And I'm curious if you see the citizen assemblies or maybe juries in that way, or larger juries, but uh, not just 10 people, but a, a group that can deliberate <laughs> over a long period of time as a more legitimate way to adjudicate these different. Uh, epistemological system. So I will leave it with that. Thank you uh, for the text. And I really enjoyed it. I recommend, recommend it to all of you. Uh, thank you for your attention too. I'd like to reply before we turn to you to Um. A couple of the small points that I really want to hear what people have to say. I mean, I think Poole doesn't say she's approaching epistemological systems neutrally. It's not a neutral approach to epistemological systems. She says that they're, the concept is normatively neutral. So it, she's simply saying they're not all um, faulty in the ways that we were describing. Because, you, yeah, you, you, but for that, you need to have a non neutral approach to judge them see which ones are. So I, I think that's what I get from her. I really um, take your challenge, but of course it's going to take some thought and work to, to try to apply this to um, democratic process. I think, and I think what you're drawing out is a debate going on in the left right now, consensus 
right? The aiming for consensus, which we fought for for decades. I fought for decades in the academy to try to do things by by consensus and a lot of Occupy, a lot of uh, social movement work was trying to operate by achieving consensus and um, other, but consensus is often an attempt to um, limit difference and sometimes paper over, you know, if we just put it in a drawer, it doesn't really go away. So I think that this, this is bringing out this, this um, the possibility of, of thinking about you know, people will still argue for consensus, but then um, not this census. I don't think it goes to the level of this census, but um, maintaining difference and yet having just a partial agreement, like a partial translation of what the priorities are going to be. And here I'm thinking of labor committees that have to decide what are we willing to strike for? What Of all the different demands that we have as diverse groups of laborers in regard to transportation, for example, and people have different issues, what are the, what are the issues that we're all willing to go to strike for? So that doesn't require an end to all our disagreements, but it does require us to come to agreement over what's going to rise to the top. Um, and I think that's um, something in a way that um, uh, De La Cadena imagines co-laboring. So it, it doesn't, it, it allows the relationship to continue. It allows movement to continue, even though it doesn't um, uh, dissolve all differences. But, but that's, there's lots more to say there, but you've got my brain going. <laughs> Right, uh, we've got uh, about a half an hour for questions. And I'll, start, I'll check my computer every now and then because people online, there are 30 people online, uh, may also have a question. So we'll explain why I'm moving around. Uh, so, why don't you go first? So, sure. so Julian, Kupa, and then David. Um, so, thank, thanks a lot. I, I really enjoyed it. My question is about what you view um, the boundaries of these epistemological systems to, to be. In the case that you used with earth beings, it seems like the difference is this difference in, in language. And that difference presents itself as kind of like a, an intuitively obvious thing that these two languages function function differently. And translation between them is going to take, take, um, take this co-laboring. But I'm wondering if the difference is the same. Like, I'm wondering who gets to choose what counts, what count as significant differences between epistemological systems and what counts as a what counts as one epistemological system and what counts as, as another epistemological system? Well, the, the earth beings is really a difference of ontological system. Um, that's what's being showcased there, right? Is, um, and this is going on all over the world in which uh, indigenous groups see rivers and, and we're now passing it, right? Bolivia passed the law, Colombia passed the law so that nature has rights, which, you know, Europeans go, what? But, <laughs> but this, this, um, there, there is a, a transition happening in um, ontological language in terms of uh, political rights being attributed to, uh, you know, natural, inert, <laughs> What are what are seen prior as natural and inert entities? So there you have a clash of ontological systems. That I'm not sure you need a third party to see the clash. I think it is a clash. Want to dress up with? No. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but it's you know between um, whether or not uh, an extractivist company has the right to take the top off of a mountain um, and doesn't have to consult the mountain, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, can instrumentalize the mountain to complete decimation, to the point of complete decimation without any, um, without any limit being imposed on it. And, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to get our head around this because how can, 
I mean, how can the mountain talk back? But of course, mountains are talking back. Not the world is talking back. Um, but how can they protect their rights, articulate their rights, right? It's actually, it's a human to human, uh, group to group contestation over how to conceptualize what is happening, how to describe the event that is happening. Um, so I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you need a third party for that. No, I wouldn't think you would either. But do I understand correctly then that for you, the kind of contours of the epistemological systems come out in conflicts between them? Is that correct? Yeah, and how they're how they're addressed. So the um, uh, you know Peruvian president has said that, or the the past one said that. Um, these are just superstitions, and I don't, I don't have any uh, obligation to listen to them, right? So he completely denies any need to negotiate, or any need to accommodate, or any need to listen at all, right? So that's an epistemological system based on technocratic expertise that alone is authorized to make decisions about natural resources. Um, and this is the way the West operates, right? We don't democratically decide anything. We, we um, give over decisions about proliferation of nuclear weapons and the production of military equipment to the technocrats. We assume they're the only ones that have the expertise. So that's an epistemological system that thwarts democracy amongst ourselves. Um, so that's, I think that's what, what the concept of epistemological system helps us to bring out. Um, is the processes you know, that flow from these ideas and then how the ontological difference is dealt with. Okay, thanks a lot. I think Lilith had a question. Oh, thanks very much for the talk. Um, so I'm kind of coming um, to sort of my question from uh, the philosophy of common science and also from uh, my work in 9th century um, Chinese diaspora and straight settlements. Um, so my first kind of question is linked to the second one, or oh, two parts really. Um, the first part of the question is, um, how much of this notion of the drawing project is a project of communication across epistemological systems compared to an emergence of a new epistemological system? Uh, how I want to understand your ontological status. Um, a new system that has its own set of significances in this uh, presumably dynamic coupling of two different epistemic agencies um, alongside their um, relevant systems without diminishing the autonomies. Um, but my, I guess the question is important for me because um, it would determine the strength of a worry that I have, which is, when we're looking at the emergence of new epistemological systems involving at least one maladapted one, um, such that the extent, such as the emergent system functions as another mechanism to maintain the maladaptation in the first case, that seems a bit warming to me. So to give a more concrete um, historical example that I'm working on, uh, to put it in terms of the talk, I, uh, I kind of work on a joint project between bourgeois 19th century Chinese Puranakans in the Straits Settlements, uh, they're called Babas. And they migrated in early dynasties and had hybridized with more local Malay cultures and populations. We're looking at a joint project between them and European colonial elites um, to communicate across the epistemological uh, systems. So they actually have societies where they set up explicitly trying to do this. Um, the trouble was that the emerging post-colonial epistemological system involved a reinforcement of a social Darwinism that the Chinese Puranagans inherited from the British education that involved a self-hatred in as much as they understood their Malay heritage as detrimental for their own cultural development. So I guess my question really is basically whether this maintenance of a maladaptive system is a bug or a feature of such communication. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a great example because it just shows how hard decolonial work is because just taking a survey of the colonized, you may get more colonial language, right? You may get more colonial ideas because of the long duration of, <laughs> of colonialism and its hegemony over educational institutions, especially. 
So I don't have a solution to that. <laughs> but except for exactly the kind of work you're doing, which is kind of, of, an, of an epistemic archaeology of the ideas and concepts that are in play here. And, you know, and I don't think that just, you know, finding out their origin is all we need to know, right? We, it's, that's not all we need to know that was invented by some British empiricists or something. Um, but it is it is important to know, and it is, it it may um, spur some more critical analysis to see, because I'm always interested in what was the function of that idea in that time and place. So the function of Locke's critique of innate ideas was to shut women up, right? <laughs> because there was a movement at the time that he was critiquing doctrine of innate ideas called the enthusiasts, which allowed women to speak in the public sphere, which was unheard of. And uh, by attacking uh, innate ideas, he shut women up. Now we could, you know, we, you could talk about the concept of innate ideas on a variety of levels, and there'll be a variety of issues to discuss, but that's one function that it had that needs to be brought out as we come to understand what his motivation was. So it's, you know, it's, it's just going to complicate the analysis. I mean, I think um, the, the project here is to create new epistemological systems, absolutely, um, and to erode some. <laughs> some need to be eroded and, you know, to give us some tools to figure out how to critique. And I think, you know, I, I have no illusions that we're going to, you know, convince um, the power brokers. That's not the project here. It's really for us, right? It's for us to figure our agenda out and to um, validate our agenda and figure out what agenda should be validated. I mean, that's the project here and to create new epistemological systems for that purpose. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the um, talk. Um, I'm, in principle, I come from the historicity of thinking and I'm pretty much with relativizing or situating knowledge, but I think it's more complex than I sometimes, than I sometimes think it is. Um, let me raise this complexity with a challenge and uh, followed by a philosophical question. Now the challenge is, uh, yeah, what you said uh, sounds very plausible in our standard left-wing academic environment. <laughs> Now reframe that into a right-wing environment. Accepted universal norms of uh, credibility should be questioned. Yes, of course they should. Look at the, the human rights ideology, you know, look at all the, the sexual perversions that is uh, legitimized by that, one example. Um, and, uh, reverse empiricism, emphasis upon ex direct experience. Yes, absolutely. Please take my experiences with male asylum seekers seriously. Stop marginalizing me with your left wing elites. Yeah. So the reason that I raise this challenge is that, um, or, or let me put it like that. I come from from say Poon incommensurability, relativism discusses of the uh, discussion of the eighties and nineties, and I find myself more and more um, emphasizing notions such as objectivity in a universal sense. And everything that comes with it that is realism yeah much more realism than was 20 years ago and uh, also truth a uh, classical no, truth yeah. so my um challenge is more to say how can we think i mean there is an objective truth uh, on the question whether there were more people at trump's in already 2016 uh, uh, uh there's an objective truth, uh, truth on that whether that is true or not um, how can we synthesize this, say, universal notions of objectivity or truth, if whatever you want to call them, which I think are mandatory in our situation? I mean, epistemology gets political at, at, at which I have to admit at a certain age, which I didn't, wouldn't have been uh, expecting when I was younger. Um, how can we synthesize these universal notions that we need at this point in history? With a more situated uh, embeddedness, the historical character of 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 uh, knowledge, um, yeah, in such a way that it's epistemology as well as politically livable. Yeah, let's call it like that. Well, I think these are really um, important issues to raise and to discuss. 
but I really disagree with your conclusion. <laughs> so I, I want to use the word truth, and I'm a realist, but I'm a pragmatic realist. I'm a Putnam type realist. And that follows from philosophy of science, right? That follows from the naturalized term in epistemology and science to see what scientists actually do. They, um, they don't really uh, argue over the, um, the status of, of the conceptual posits that they make. They're looking for functionality, right? So what drove me crazy about um, the, the COVID public discourse to try to get people to vaccinate was the language, follow the science, believe the scientists. That's treating population as if they're children. It's incorrect. It's not the way any um, self-respecting philosopher of science would say, because we know that um, when you say that a vaccine is safe, you need to unpack what, what is actually being said. There's a, it's safe because it's been tested among white males in North America, right? Well, that's okay. That's a certain safety, but that's not necessarily safe for everybody else. And we need to know that. And the public needs to know that. So there, there are right ways to complicate the vaccine debate, and there are wrong ways to complicate the vaccine debate. There is, there is a level of, of truth here about what um, the pharmaceutical companies have done in their testing and how it is short-term rather than long-term, right? And there are questions about, you know, we need to continue to do long-term but we also have a, pu a public epidemic. So it was values choices that were made here. And let's be honest about that, right? We decided as a society or whoever made the <laughs> capacity to decide that it was safe because of the level of, of death that was likely to be incurred if we did not vaccinate everybody. So that was a, that was a value laden decision, which is, all of medicine is all the time, right? This is what science does all the time. And portraying it as in, an empirical deductive operation is wrong politically, not only because it treats population as children, but because once they find out, if they take a philosophy of science class and they find out what the way medicine actually operates, they're going to be pissed off and they're going to be. Um, they're gonna they're gonna say a pox on you and, and I'm not gonna believe anything you say anymore. So I think I think the truth is on our side. Um, but the truth is always going to be complicated and it's always going to be the product of value-laden decisions about whether a vaccine is safe, the statement the vaccine is safe. Well, that's we could yes, I can say yes, this is true, but I also need to know. What is what are we really saying there? We're saying it's safe. How far can we, you know, go with that statement? And what what is what is limited by it? So that's that's where I, I you know I would disagree. Not the old fashioned ideas of truth. Not the old fashioned ideas of science. More realistic, which is you know what's been produced in philosophy of science. So in my time of my career, which is pretty long, um, it's really gotten a lot better because, you know, philosophy of science used to take the conclusions of scientific textbooks to study instead of taking the actual practices in laboratories. And the actual practices in laboratories, as Latour and Wolgar and so many others showed, is a, is a negotiation, it's an accommodation, it's a complexity. So, um, the other piece that you're raising is about um, applying it to the right wing, you know, massive, which uh, um, again, I think is, is an important issue. So um, I think about this in the context of labor movements, because I'm kind of close to the labor movements in the United States on a daily basis. And um, everybody's not, you know, down with anti-racism or anti-homophobia, right? <laughs> On a bargaining committee or in a, in a particular um, union. So it's a process of, of education and negotiation and accommodation. 
and an attempt to, to find common ground and how do you do that by um, seeing, you know, what are the legitimate concerns of the farmers in the next, right? They have legitimate concerns. They have a culture of, of you know, multi-generational culture of making a living in certain ways that they want to hold on to. Can't we all, you know, see the value of that and see the legitimacy of that and then figure out a way to move forward rather than saying, oh, it's not a problem. You can just become a, a data um, analyst. <laughs> People don't want to be a data. I don't want to be a data. Right? Like work outside with animals and, and nature. So I think there's, you know, there, it's a much, there's a lot more conversation to have than technocratic experts telling farmers what kind of life they should lead. Right? There, there is, there is knowledge and there's validity and there's valid values on the side of them. And what the fascists do, and this is what the fascists do in, in my country as well, is uh, they give the farmers a narrative. They give the farmers an analysis. They give the farmers a solution, and we don't. We tell the farmers you're stupid, just do what we tell you to do. With that provocative statement. <laughs> I know I'm getting into y'all's business. What do I know about the farmers? <laughs> but, uh, Monica, are you okay with us doing an, an online question first yeah, yeah. and then turning to you? Yeah. Is that okay? All right, so there's an online question by Flores saying, uh, thank you, Linda, for this highly relevant talk and for lucidly articulating the importance of power structures in epistemic situations, uh, epistemic questions. I have a question about the experience versus knowledge issue. You seem to point, that, to point out that our world tends to value knowledge over experience, downplaying the views of those who actually have experience. However, in the doctors versus nurses example, it seems to me, that the doctor's knowledge is, or at least should ultimately be based in experience. It's just that ideally their knowledge is a processed form of experience, an aggregation of a bigger set of clinical observations. So I'm, uh, what I'm wondering is whether the valuing of knowledge over experience is really due to valuing experience or valuing the processes of aggregation of that experience. If you're willing to comment, I'd appreciate hearing your view on this. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a good question because I went too quickly over this. I mean, I think it's, I'm an empiricist, you know, a radical empiricist and an empiricist. Um, experience is worth knowledge. The, the issue though, that's going on with the doctors and the nurses and also uh, the reverse empiricism I was talking about is particular kinds of experience. So, um, uh, victims of child sexual abuse are seen often as hysterics. And so if, if you get asked to serve on a jury on a case of child sexual abuse and you have yourself been sexually abused as a child, you're not on the jury, right? Because the idea is you're going to see it everywhere. You're going to jump to conclusions. You're going to be so motivated so motivated that you might put an innocent person in jail or something like that. So there's certain experiences having to do often with gender and race and ethnicity and religion that are the ones that are interestingly subject to this kind of reverse empiricism. It's not all experiences. Um, and, and it's, I think it's kind of like a post hoc, whatever you, that logical flaw uh, is, where you, you figure out a way to disauthorize people after the fact. So you figure out a way to disauthorize people of color from being experts on racism or survivors of, of rape or sexual abuse from being experts on, on those topics. And I don't think you know that 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 um, survivors are uh, without question, you know, that there's absolute deference that's owed to people. I'm not saying that, but I am, but I do think that people who have been, uh, this topic of my last book, people who have been sexually abused as children, 
may have the capacity for discerning patterns of behavior, may be able to generate hypotheses. So it's not that they have final say, but they may be able to have certain levels of discernment that other people don't. They may have epistemic advantages in other way, in other words, rather than and and the other thing that's interesting about about it is that people who are victimized by racism or sexual violence have a very, very strong motivation to know the truth. Because they have a very, very strong motivation to try to reduce the problem. Right? So they don't want to jump to conclusions that are stupid conclusions. They want to understand what's really happening here and what really needs to happen to, to reduce the problem. Thanks. Um, first very well, because my question was about the worst empiricism too. Um, the child's rights, as you know very well, would connect the dots um, saying that the richness of financial knowledge relates to the relatively uneven access to material resources. And that is why you need um, thinking with him and with you. <laughs> so this uh, is how I would connect the dots to your robust to serve epistemic systems. That is the reason why you need epistemic, robust epistemic systems, because the epistemic systems which are in place now are simply reproducing an uneven material access. Um, would this be a correct interpretation of what you were doing? Because I thought um, this knowledge from below is going in a similar direction. And whether this is one interpretation of that topic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Um, and I think uh, putting knowledge, you know, I mean, and another thing that we've done in philosophy is we've is, um, is really um, gotten rid of the science and technology split, right? We know that you can't really talk about pure science or pure pursuits of, of scientific knowledge for its own sake. It's always connected to technology. So the, so the material resources question always has to be there. Um, so I, don't, I mean, I'll give you another example of a case study I'm trying to, to develop. Um, that telescope that's being put on the mountain in Hawaii, that, with, that it's, you know, there's ongoing protests. It's the 13th telescope being put on this mountain that is considered a, a holy site by a number of indigenous groups over there. And so the, so it's being portrayed as, again, you know, this, this um, uh, material resource we need for pure knowledge has nothing to do with the material resources question. But it is the 13th, when I found out it was the 13th telescope on it, why does there have to be, and, and to, to, you know, to get this telescope as huge as it is, to be able to see as far as they wanted to see, they have to like drill down really far. So they're really messy. So why do we, why does it have to be the 13th? Because China has one, India has one, Russia has one. So this is, <laughs> this is the way scientific, practice happens in our world today. Everybody, every country has to have their own telescope. So that's about material resources. That's not about pure knowledge. So I think bringing, you know, always asking the question of what's the context of this particular inquiry? What's the context of this particular knowledge project? Um, doesn't give you automatic ways to to reject it, but does give you some context that may be relevant to understanding the knowledge that is being pursued here and what kind of knowledge is being pursued here, um, competitive across um, rich countries. I don't know if that gets it. Yes, I think you're just some of it, I know, not all of it. <laughs> Are there any uh, remaining urgent uh, questions? Almost an hour, never a moment. We're nearing the end of the day. Push further. Uh, no, I think I will make the room to say something more. Right? Are there no further questions? So you could say something else if you want to. Um, let's see. 
I'm not sure. I think I heard uh, interesting questions as well, and I think the the uh, yeah, I think the issue is now to do these things and to see and to experiment to see how that works. What what are the uh, yeah. How does it work in practice if you try to do these co-labor activities, right? I'm really curious to see, to make it less, uh, sorry, less philosophical and more sociological um, to put it in practice. Um, so I hope to meet again in a year or two and uh, discuss these sort of uh, practices. Can I ask you yeah, something? Oh, I was wondering, so do these, and you have done all this research with people in the conspiracy milieu. Do you did it feel like you were co-laboring? No, <laughs> no, but no, I no, yeah, no. is this does it, does it make sense to you to pull it that way or to, to use a similar kind of yeah. idea? Um that's a good question. I think uh um yes and no. So I think for my research, less. Um, because then I allowed also for less space for them to collaborate with me. But later on, when we made the, uh, the visual story group together with the photographer and graphic designer, and we let these people write their chapters as well, right? So there was a more of a cooperative uh, effort there. Um, so in that way, I think the last sort of uh, book that was meant for the general public uh, was much more of a collaborative effort. Um, but yeah, as a scientist, like, it's like it's, it, it, uh, yeah, I don't know, this is also work that has been done years ago, right? So now these uh, new ideas develop, would it look differently, the kind of knowledge that I've produced, if it was done more in collaboration with these various conspiracy theories? I think that's something I need to think about, uh, yeah. Um, but in any case, as a, as a sort of ethnographic researcher, there are multiple moments where you test your ideas with the people that you're studying, right? So in that way, it becomes a more of a collaborative uh, co-laboring because uh, I cannot say whatever I think is true about these people uh, if they tell me that's, that it's bullets, right? Uh, that would be a, a more traditional way to research so describing people making all kinds of assumptions, ideas about uh, them. For me, these are not valid if they're not collaborated by the people themselves, if they don't. So this is always for me a, a big uh, validation of uh, my research. If the people I speak about uh, see themselves in the stories that I write. Um, and yeah. This is, maybe this is just linguistics, but if they're not collaborated by them and co-laboring, <laughs> well, they, these words kind of <laughs> yeah. very close to one another. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a similar question you posed this morning uh, in the sense of what do you do when you dialogue on people's uh, ideas, or notions, concerns, then what is the goal? Uh, so I'm constantly fighting, I, I completely, I, I can see how you, but I also have this question, how would it work out empirically? Mm -hmm. So is there a, it would be really interesting to see what the collab, maybe co-laboring or co-constructing, you, you always co-construct, so it doesn't have to be, you're always in a sense co-labor when you see that as a neutral kind of neutral concept because you will construct but then maybe that's enough for as a goal because um, uh, somebody asked so what is the goal a new epistemic system for example but then how would that then work yeah, because yeah it, would you start from this is more valuable than something else or would you then end up i mean you can also if you Look at it the other way around. For example, sometimes experience is asked for somebody to know, to say something. You haven't experienced World War II, so you can't judge it, right? But then it's used the other way around. Uh, so yeah, it, it remains tricky, I guess. To um, it, it works from a notion of this is the underdog, these are the powerful, and uh, um, yeah. 
but I mean, no, it's kind of a, no. maybe I can just say in what, that I think when we, if we move away from sort of decontextualized universal epistemology to contextualized epistemology, mm -hmm. like I'm not even thinking about how do we co labor with anybody and everybody, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not, not interested, <laughs> and it's not going, you know. So, I'm, I, we're looking at for corrective norms um, in non ideal and non ideal world applied to specific cases. So, Marisol de la Cadena is um, a theorist working with the indigenous. She's not from an extractivist, she's not trying to bring together extractivist capitalists yeah. and the indigenous, right? So, um, you just need to disempower. The active capitalist, right? You don't need to like co labor. <laughs> I don't know. I think you also do. Uh, in, some in some way, like, right? The, the, these people are confronted with miners, mining companies, perhaps, that excavate on mountains. So that own the mountains. We can, we can decide not to talk to them, uh, not to co labor with them, but then they overrule all the other epistemologies by uh, power. Yeah. Right. Well, they so. don't actually own the mountains. The way it happens is um, uh, poor countries of the world have to compete with each other to, to attract capital. And the way they attract capital, they say the government says, we'll let you come into this area and we will suspend labor rights. Mm -hmm. We will suspend environmental rights so that you can do whatever you want in this area. So it's political. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fighting on the political terrain. I mean, ownership is also, of course, but as Marx would say, <laughs> but it's it's uh, it's governments that make these decisions in order, and and then they get the they get taxes from the extractivist labor that then they argue they can public infrastructure and social welfare decisions. I want not to exclude that so man has to say no, and because then you will, in a way, they still co construct what is happening, but then they're not in your corner, so to speak. So I don't but know. I mean, why can't we just give refusal a privileged domain? Mm -hmm. Because like then this idea, liberal idea of like, I cannot just exclude. Why can't we just accept refusal as a legitimate form of engaging? And that's what we exclude. I mean, it's still, yeah. yeah but then the idea of like who's speaking, clearly you are speaking because you're the one asking the question. Mm -hmm. So start from there because otherwise we're just going to have the like second forms ideas of like, oh, I just cannot exclude. We have to talk. I mean, you talked about the semantics of it. I think. There's no linguistic connection between co-laboring and collaborating because co-laboring, uh, but it's much more of this converse and convert. They have the same Latin and Proto-Indo-European root of the aim of conversing becomes converting. So then you don't have this, I don't know, uh, different ideas coming together, but it's just, it just becomes another form of domination. So I think in that moment, we should able to have this refusal, a bit of this human strike where you can just say, no, and then back out. Because otherwise we're just like gonna, I think keep on thinking with this very Dutch also liberal way of dialogue, which is not going anywhere. I totally don't agree with your conception of dialogue. So we should talk about it. It's really Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Um, right. So fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we wrap up, let me thank uh, you all. I think your fourth contribution to any, something related to the Extreme Beliefs Project. So a lecture making special issues possible, a chapter, and now a reply. So thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, it's in my hand. Um, and uh, for example, Linda, thank you also for this uh, wonderful presentation today. Um, I think the event that led to your lecture today was a conference that Nora and you and I attended last year yeah. in um, mm -hmm. Sevilla, Spain. So I'm afraid that neither the weather nor the food can equal anything. <laughs> and yet, I hope that you will have a uh, splendid and fruitful time here in the Netherlands. So let us thank both hearts.